So, good evening ma'am and welcome to the Krishna Kanta Handic State Open University. We are indeed very, very happy that you are here with us. Uh, you are in the helm of affairs of the entire domain of the open and distance learning. And at many point of time there are doubts at various segments at various levels as to what would be the future of the whole ODL system. So, what is your feeling about it? How do you see ODL in the next 20, 25 years? What is your view on it? You know, it is very interesting that in developing countries, right. open and distance learning as we know it is growing phenomenally. You know that in our own country, right. we have 17 open universities, right. you know, 15 public and two private. Uh, in Africa, again the open universities are growing, dedicated single mode universities. In fact, this month on 1st December, a new open university has uh, been established in uh, Botswana right. by an act of parliament, by the government. So in developing countries, most governments are seeing open universities as a way forward for increasing access to quality education at lower costs. Mm -hmm. In developed countries, for example in Canada, right. where the Commonwealth of Learning is located, uh, we had three open universities, dedicated open universities. Now there is only one left. Okay. The other two have merged with campus universities. Right. It is a different type of thing. You know, here we have campus universities and they offer distance right. learning. Mm. Their distance and edu education institutions have merged with campus universities. Mm. And the reason is because of the growth of technology. Every institution is now doing online learning. Right. So, there the tendency is not to have any further dedicated institutions for distance education. Mm. But in our part of the world, in Asia for example, there are more than 70 distance open, open and distance learning universities. So, this trend is going to continue to grow. Um, so, I think we are uh, quite safe. We see a okay. uh, prospective few, sir. We have a good future, but the good future will depend upon the quality Definitely. and about our ability to compete with emerging trends. Right. Madam, why have they done that? Why, why these universities have marched with the campus universities? See, there are several reasons, you know, political reasons are there also that the political will was not there to have them continue. The second is that uh, the distinction between an open university and a campus university is blurring. Blurring, it's oh. getting thinner. Because many people, you know, about I think more than 35 percent in the US are doing one or two courses using distance learning even though they are enrolled in the campus. Right. So, in the developed <coughs> world because of the growth of technology, mm. uh, there is no need really to have dis dedicated distance learning institutions. So, that is probably the reason. Mm, Thank that you. That brings us to the issue of this developed countries vis a vis the developing countries. So, as you have rightly stated in the developed countries, because of the technology enabled factors, so they are in a better position to disseminate the information to reach to the various categories of people. But ma'am, one although in our country also, we talk about uh, recently we have been talking a lot about ICT, ICT enabled delivery mechanism, but here we have been in Assam. Right, we can come to the grassroots level issues. In our university also we are trying to promote the mobile apps, computer based learning and all those things. But in the far flung areas connectivity is a problem. The real these are the infrastructural issues are there. Because of all these things we have not been able to take the maximum advantage of the ICT enabled devices. And uh, But although this is a call of the day and responding to this call of the day most of the open universities in developed countries they are doing so well. What is your take on this? See, uh, the growth uh, in technology in developing countries has been mostly in mobile devices, right. mm. not in computers mm. or laptops or mm. anything. It is mostly mm. mobile devices mm. and that is where, that is the technology we should tap. Mm. And if we are looking at remote areas, how can we reach people through radio? Radio is still a very relevant technology in some of the remote areas. Sure. Uh, basic mobile phones, people do not have smartphones, but they do have basic mobile phones which give us the ability hmm. to uh, 
interact you know even uh, verbally uh, through voicemail and so on uh, with those people so we should actually see how we can harness the available affordable and accessible technologies to reach the last person in the queue in remote areas that's the silence for the odl institutions it is it is mm. uh, another very important concerns that we have here too that is regarding the quality issues here most of the people think that the open and distance learning is a second grade arrangement in comparison to the campus system now uh, here too we are trying our best to see to it that we provide best of quality of things to the learners we are trying our best we are putting our resources in it but it is true that the mindset is gradually declining in that part but at the same time what we also find that there sometimes there is a sudden surcharge of the activities that the open and distance learning is not worth of the present generation because it is too technical too sophisticated to be addressed by the open and distance learning so uh, this mindset and the quality issues on the other hand how do you go for it ma'am it's a very challenging thing for us you know one uh, uh, there are two <coughs> reasons why people have this poor perception <coughs> about odl in our countries one is the earlier correspondence courses right were not very learner centric hmm. you dump the material on the student and expect them to do the exam so obviously it was considered of lower quality the second is that uh, some of the providers are not following the quality parameters properly right. because if we do odl well and this research has shown you know there is a book which is called no significant difference mm. in which they have done a meta analysis of hundreds of studies about you know the difference between distance learning and campus learning and there is no significant difference in the outcomes from either mode okay that's very interesting so that is one mm. the other studies are that if you look at online and face to face again uh, this was a study done by a person in south korea who again did a meta analysis and they found that distance uh, online learning costs half of what face to face costs and yet the outcomes are exactly okay. the same same mm. there is no difference in the outcomes mm -hmm. so the key uh, thing to remember is that while there is no significant difference right. it has to be done well that right. is true are we doing it well this is a question we have to ask ourselves mm -hmm. because you know anything that we do it is for the student different students learn in different ways how are we reaching them right. how are we responding to their needs yes. how are we addressing the issues which they face mm -hmm. i mean if we can answer yes to those questions that means yes we are doing well yeah. but are we Yes, ma'am. Now, for the benefit of your information, <laughs> in our university also, last year one research project was completed, and that ultimately led to the award of PhD degree. That was about the effectiveness of, uh, from the learner's perspective, face-to-face -face mode versus ODL mode in tourism and hospitality sector. And different statistical tests were conducted based on uh, respondents' responses, and it was found, like as you have pointed out in some other contexts, the same. there is no significant difference between f to f mode and exactly. odl mode so that is okay from the tourism and hospitality sector but from the macro perspective one something we find it a kind of dichotomous thing that you also have stated about that but still my mind is not fully clear about this democratization of education we talk about inclusive growth we may talk about inclusive education also now if we talk about inclusive education we we'll have to start from the base so base could be the certificate courses the diploma courses etc from the learners perspective we'll go for the inclusive education and as you have rightly stated that we may make use of the technology enabled factors right accessible affordable but the thing is that we will try to go for democratization of education but in the perspective we might somehow may be required to compromise the quality issues maybe in terms of the networking relationships because the open universities are not kind of a stand alone institutions they have to depend upon a number of partners 
educational partners could be the study centers, the counselors and all those things. So, going at this from the macro perspective, going for the larger objective of democratization of education, then reconciling the quality issues, how to strike the balance somewhere or other. See, there is a difference between massification and democratization. Right. But <coughs> democratization <coughs> means more equity which leads to equality of opportunity. Hmm. So, we must make that distinction between massification okay. and democratization. That is okay. the first point. Hmm. The second is that democratization does not mean dilution of quality. Hmm. You can democratize, hmm. but you know in distance education there are three very important components. One is the academic component which is the quality of the materials we give to the students. Sure. The second is the learner support hmm. and the third is the administration, management and administration you know that is the third dimension. How well have we created systems which are so robust that we are able to meet the large numbers of students and that is why it is good to have you know sometimes an evolutionary approach that you sort of increase the numbers really when the system can take the weight of those that, numbers. Right, right. And one of the areas where we are really the weakest perhaps hmm. is learner support. We are not giving the kind of learner support that the students are getting in different universities in some of the you know top universities ODL institutions in the world. Uh, for example, I mean research has shown that the dropout rate in open universities is very high. Mm. One of the factors is that we the students join with a great deal of motivation, gradually they lose that motivation and they drop out. What can we do about it? People have made lots of recommendations and one of the recommendation is that keep the student engaged. Be in constant touch with the student. Earlier it was difficult, how do you stay in touch you know because maybe they came to the study center for the personal contact programs. Right. But other than that there was no way of keeping them constantly engaged. But now all the students have WhatsApp on their phones. How can we link them all to each other and to our centers and to our counselors? That is one, you know how to keep them engaged. The second is how to give them quick feedback. Because of this massification and you know the large numbers, we are, de we are very late in giving the feedback on assignments sure. mm. and the kind of feedback we get give is very hel not helpful at all. I mean it is just general kind of feedback which you give to the PhD student that rewrite this. For an undergraduate and lower levels you need to be more structured and more specific in what they have to do differently to do right. better. So, I think there are certain things which we can do to change our own <coughs> practices. That is true. And if we do that, then I think we can compete with no, anybody in the in world. In that regard, may I express an apprehension? Apprehension means that things that the motivation is a very complex phenomenon. The kind of things that you have mentioned is mostly would be highly applicable for the genuine learners, those who are having the genuine learning needs. So, we can think about keeping them engaged, but some may be uh, may not be a significant majority, but uh, some learners may not have that kind of genuine needs. They just take the enrollment and they just want to get through. So, you say my point is it is a two way thing. From our side we can do it, we are doing it, maybe we are lacking it, we can keep on, we may, may think about improving on it, but the learners may not be, they might detach themselves. So, keeping them engaged how to develop that kind of motivation? See even the learners that you say uh, who are only there to you know Maybe. enroll and get through yeah. with the degree and are not genuinely interested in learning, for them that is the motivation to get that piece right. of paper. So, even they are motivated, <coughs> how do we still keep them motivated? The others who are genuine learners are self motivated you yes, know I do not think do. they need much help from yeah, us because they, they love their learning. Own. Yes. They will do, but the, I think the ones who are not motivated are the ones we have to motivate hmm. because uh, onus lies with us the ODL service providers. Yes hmm. and recently we have done a you know survey of 27 commonwealth open universities and uh, we sent out questionnaires and we asked people what they what were their big achievements, what was the pass rate. And on an average, this is including the British Open University, including Athabasca University in Canada, including our universities, 
the average uh, qualification rate and the earth uh, you know people who are qualifying from our system is not more than 15 percent and in some cases it's even two percent so how do we increase those numbers and how do we actually not just provide access but also success that's this low pass percentage is not a demotivating factor this uh, 15 percent is only coming out successful 15 is uh, very low yes i mean two is even worse yes but uh, you know we have to increase the numbers <coughs> how do we do it and yes. i think um, engaging genuinely the students and for that i think uh, our own staff that deals with the you know learner support system have to be constantly trained and retrained and all the new methods which are coming out, whether it's uh, assessment techniques and so on, how to motivate people, etc., how to do good counseling, how to good, do good tutoring, that kind of training and retraining con we, we need to continue to invest in. That's a very good investment. Investment on faculty development, uh, on, you know, learner support, support, support people, support. our faculties, everything. Hmm. That is very important. <clears throat> Ma'am, coming to the quality issues again. Of the various quality parameters, uh, which would you like to emphasize the most? There are many p parameters, the components for a region like Northeast India, which is economically very poor in spite of having huge economic resources the per capita growth rate is very low, the most of the people are very poor. So, quality mem suffers in the uh, number of stages. So, for a university like us, what would be your advice that do this first? Well, I mean, we all know what the quality, you know, inputs, processes and outputs yes, are. Yes, yes. And earlier it used to be uh, input, which was the major, you know, factor of quality and the process. Now it's the output. Right. What is it that you're achieving? But I think for an institution like this one, and I'll give you one example from a institution in Uganda. Mm -hmm. It's a teacher training institute. Okay. And every weekend they have, you know, the students come to certain designated after from very far. Some come on bicycles, some come walking, very similar to this region. Mm. And the counselors are tutoring them, the tutor, tutors are tutoring them in those sessions. And I was very uh, impressed and touched really when I found that if a student doesn't come for two counseling lessons, you know, for two weekends. Okay the poor counsellors and tutors are also themselves poor. They are sitting on their, they are getting on the bicycle. Right. They are going to the house of the student okay. and asking them what happened, why didn't you come. Hmm. There is no technology involved here. Right. Bicycle. right. So, uh. if you ask my opinion that hmm. what is the biggest factor of quality which right. this institution should have, I would call it the culture of care. Yes. yes care yes, for your yes. students. You know, that culture of care, if we have each one of our tutors, our faculty members, our administrators think that, you know, every learner is important. What mm. can I do to ensure that nobody gets, you know, left, left out? That's it. That's so, if it. you ask me for one advice, yes. let us create a culture of care Thank and you. then everything falls in place. The rest is all, you know. You yeah. can tick the boxes as many times ah. as you like, but unless you care for the students and the learners, mm. nothing really, you know, the significant yeah, outcomes. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you very much. Mm. That's a very important point that quality has to be imbibed and that learner centricity and this is an organization wide, university wide phenomenon from the faculty members as well as the support staff uh, service providers, everyone will have to imbibe that quality orientation. That is very important. But somehow or other, once again I am expressing the, suppose we are talking about learner centricity. Say in one of the open universities, they have organized all the exams in one center only, state capital. Suppose we think about doing the same thing, replicating the same exercise here in Assam, some of the learners will give a complaint. 
that you are not taking care of the learners but the university will take care of that thing just to simplify the processes and to streamline the evaluation system etc so they are also possibly would have to find our own ways out to strike the balances means how to give the maximum of the learner learner care at the same time not jeopardizing our operational deficiencies you know what we have done actually is for our own operational convenience we have cut many things hmm. which are absolutely critical for the learner yes Hmm. Let's not do that. Let's not, you know, look only for operational convenience. I know it's important. Yes. But hmm. as you said, you know, it, there has to be a balance between the two. Hmm. But always, I think, if we keep the learner at the center, that should be the guiding then, thing. Then that culture of care can be, you know, hmm. embedded within the institution. And that will lead us automatically to make the right choices, to do the right thing for the students. Hmm. Whenever in conflict, just take that as a guiding principle. Uh, exactly. Yes. Um, what is your view about the how MOOC could be a very effective instrument in the whole learning process of the open and la distance system? How MOOC could help us? You know, MOOC, uh, uh, a massive open online course yeah. for those who don't know what MOOC is. Um, firstly. Uh, it's a very important development in higher education and it's coming to other areas also. Um, it creates a connected classroom around the world because when you offer a MOOC, anybody anywhere in the world can take it. Right. Uh, but as far as our students are concerned, some of them at this point may not be in a position to connect. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. if we use a high technology option. Mm -hmm. But at the Commonwealth of Learning, what we've done is we have created MOOCs for development, mm. which means that uh, a MOOC can be offered using uh, an interface with a mobile phone mm. and using a blended approach. So I think there are two, three dimensions. One is, let me first complete yes. this one, that uh, uh, we ran a MOOC for Malis. Malis are gardeners. And this was done in Uttar Pradesh area and the Malis had basic cell phones, the gardeners had basic cell phones and they could actually access all the content about horticulture on their basic mobile phone in Hindi. Okay. So you know that language barrier was not there, they could understand, they learnt a lot and when they needed to get in touch with experts, we mobilized certain call centres where they could actually ring up 24 7 and get answers to whatever uh, were their problems or issues or questions from experts. So there are different ways of that's actually… The blend, that's the blending? This that's is the blending. Blended, yes, that's blended, the blending. You know, that means no, it was center? not entirely online. Yeah. Okay. And uh, for example, <coughs> the other MOOC for development example in Sierra Leone, you know, it's a remote country, very poor one of the least developed countries in the commonwealth. Uh, we offered a MOOC on uh, using mobiles for learning and people were interested in that. Mm. But they said we do not have the bandwidth on the computer for, inter uh, for you know uh, downloading the content. Mm. So you send us the content on a CD-ROM. Okay. So mm. we sent all the content on the CD-ROM so mm. they could put it in the you know thing and they could uh, go offline and mm. look at that. And they saved the bandwidth for interaction with the peers and with the tutors. Okay. So they found a solution. Mm. And these are the kinds of ways in which we have to try to not exclude anybody. Let's use the MOOC platform, mm. but let's see where, how to reach those unreached people right. and create a blended approach. Because uh, the other research, uh, what research shows is that in our part of the world in developing countries, the blended approach, you know, where there is some face to face interaction uh, plus online works better than entirely online. Entirely. So I think we can do that. Hmm. The other dimension of MOOC is that, uh, you know, this MIT, um, the Massachusetts in yes, Institute the technology. of Technology, hmm. what they have done is they are offering MOOCs. Hmm. It's called the MicroMasters. You know, you can do some credits on a MOOC, which is, I mean, the content is free, but for the certification, you have to pay a small amount. And then 
once you have passed that, when you come to the masters in MIT, one semester you get exemption from. So, okay. you know, even our government is talking about that in India, mm. that you can do 20 percent of your swayam. degree mm. on swayam. Mm. Mm. And you know, carry the credits towards a mm -hmm. you know full uh, credit degree. Okay. Uh, you can uh, mm -hmm. this thing. Mm -hmm. So I think these are interesting things. Mm -hmm. But the point to note is that when we do these interesting things, we should not leave the last person mm -hmm. in the queue behind. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Let's carry them along. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, the message that we have got from this interaction so far is that the emerging trends are there. The issues are also there. We will have to reconcile the issues and we will have to transform ourselves the ODL service providers in then respond to the call of the days exactly. in terms of imbibing the ICT and quality orientation, learner centricity, these are the things that we will have to yes, take care of. And the last man in the last row yes. will have to be taken care of. As the democratization last and man and last woman. <laughs> <laughs> as for this university ma'am, we have already offered ourselves for the Commonwealth of Learning, this what you call scanning or scrutiny, call rim, call call rim. rim. Mm. and we have already done it and we have uh, got a new uh, letter from uh, this concerned office that uh, the system could be renewed again. So, we, we are ready for another term of this call rim exercise and for that the university is getting ready for that and uh, I seek your blessings for that <laughs> and <laughs> we, we in the university were highly benefited out of the last exercise because when the eminent personalities came as the cold dream reviewer, many of the areas, I came from the conventional system here to when I joined as the dean academic and here only during the course of the whole domain whole exercise that I came to know many of the dynamics of the ODL system. So, that way I personally was highly benefited of the exercise and the university too, it was a great exercise for us. And now I think uh, in the coming years also uh, the, the kind of mechanism your organization has developed, the universities will definitely be benefited out of those exercises and we are very hopeful about that. No, but I must congratulate KK SHOU for uh, you know offering to undertake this exercise because it's it requires extra hard work. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, but uh, at the end of it, hmm. uh, you came out very well from the whole process. Hmm. And this call review and improvement model is meant to create that culture of uh, quality within the institution. So, by involving everybody and you know making them think about it, you know reflect on various things, they start thinking that you know how can I improve this. So, it is a very good exercise and I think the next phase is the follow up, follow up on the yeah. recommendations. recommendations. So, thank you very much ma'am. It has been a, a pleasure, thank you. Yeah, we have good come to, see to know again. lot many and possibly you have developed some clarities also. These are all so many complex phenomenon quality, motivation, we have discussed so many things and we have got some clarity with the interaction with you. Thank you ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And thank you very much for informing us that we are indeed safe. <laughs> uh, the, the campus is not a challenge to us, we are not getting merged into the campus anymore. No, no, but you know the thing is that uh, like uh, Mao Zedong said, mm let a thousand flowers bloom, bloom. Yes. there is enough need in the world. Yes. So, there will be ODL institutions, there will be dual mode providers, there will be private providers, there will be cross border providers, there will yes. be MOOC Room. providers, everybody has a place. The only thing is that our place of ODL, we should really sort of try to make it stronger and more valuable for the student. And Thank to that much. extent we are in an advantageous position. Thank you, man. Thank you very Thank much. You.